evening and welcome to Culture of Pain. Uh, in tonight's episode, we are going to look at our what's caught our eye in the miniatures world in the last week or two. And then for our main segment today, we've got a fantastic guest, uh, hobby hero and all-around friend of the podcast, Mr. Tui K. Here to talk a few, a few things, Dogma 48 and a few other bits and pieces as well. Now, um, Culture of Pain is aimed at a mature audience, so we might use the odd bad word, but we promise we'll try not to do it too much. So let's talk about some paint. Good evening, everybody. We are here. The chat is live. Evening all. Um, lads, hello to you all. Hi to Andy. Hi to Matt. Good day. Good day. Uh, and hello to Mr. 2K. How are you doing, buddy? You all right? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Excellent. And thank you for hosting me. <laughs> Not a problem at all. Not a problem. Um, right. So without too much ado, we're going to jump straight into our court picks. So Matt, what have we got first, bud? So first up, we have... Oh, this is me. Yes, you so, uh, went for the triple dip this time. Well, kind a of triple double. dip. It's not a triple <laughs> dip. It is absolutely not a triple dip. That is not true. It's three <laughs> pictures of the same project. Fine. <laughs> All right. And the only reason yeah, there's three on. pictures is it's re it's really important for me to stress how mental one. this project is. Right. Okay. So this is the first one. one. This is the first one that I saw, and I was like, "That's insane. It's really cool. Like dystopian, futuristic, mental." It's only then when I found out how big it is that I thought that it was absolutely next level batshit crazy. Um, Two mil like high. A, it's like, no, it's like a 172 scale Napoleon horseman. And then the guy who created it has used like a skeleton zombie warrior as the other one uh, who's got a washing machine on their back. So I basically saw it and thought it was one of the most interesting and most unique things I've ever seen really. Uh, it's all it's not scratch built it's just a like kit bash but then all the clothes and the materials all is all scratch built and added on and there's loads of photos of him making it and it's just one of the most bizarre but amazing things i think i've ever seen so uh yeah that's why it was my pick very like um yeah dystopian uh futuristic style like that, the you can see the size of that model with the pair of um, tweezers that are attached to its foot it's not yeah. something I wouldn't ex I would expect something like this from you, Tue. It's the kind of project. Yeah, <laughs> kind of. If you said it was you, I'd be like, yeah, it is. <laughs> it, it's way too small for me, though. <laughs> too small? <laughs> too yeah, small. Yeah, that's, just, that's too short for that, that kind of scale. <laughs> yeah. I don't um, even know where to start with that size. Well, no, it's I, really I, cool. It's really cool. I, I really love how the, uh, how the base is painted up onto the... To, to the to the legs of the of the figures and it, it's just sort of all smooshed together i think it's just paper pulp yeah and yeah, it's, it's really very cool. like sort of slightly grim dark style and it was just, mm -hmm. just yeah i just thought it was great and it's something a bit different and i like the fact that it's a napoleonic horseman and some yeah. random zombie from a different game or a different game system and who's the and artist? A washing machine attached to it uh, Piotr uh, Galatki, I think his proper name is. I'm sorry if I've just butchered that name horrifically, but yeah, that's where I found it. I found it on Facebook. But we'll link, as always, we're going to link all the people that we mention, all the descriptions uh, in the description of the video, so you can find everyone and follow everybody. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see that at a show, to be honest. That's, that, would, yeah, that would get me excited, right? Yeah, I'm really hoping it does make the rounds. I'm hoping that we do get to see it in real life because it, it's interesting from every angle. I'd love to see what it looks like. You know, in the reels. So yeah, that's I my pick. Plint is that? Sorry, like the plinth, the 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 thingy that they're they're standing on. It, it looks topical. It looks it like does. something you would choose to have a connection to it. Mm. Yeah, and it's also, or it could be like I think it might be an old picture frame that's put on its yeah. side, maybe. Yeah. Um, love the love the idea of using picture frames to dictate the size of pieces. Yeah, it's like a lid of a box to me or something. I don't know. Yeah, but so it could cool. be sort of the, the lid of an ammo box from the Russian. Yeah, that's what I think. Uh, yeah. Something yeah. top of that. Yeah, very good. But yeah, that was my pick. So I loved it. Very so cool. who have we got next? Next up is... Oh, oh. that's fine. That's fine. I wanted to pick this as well because I love it. So <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's, it's really, really cool. It's, it's Jamie who's been painting with those kind of colors for a long time but mm -hmm. is really bringing it into a more sort of artistic direction now uh, he did this one and it's his second uh, week in a row uh, 
the the tiny 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 bust from um, mm. uh, Fernandes, yeah. uh, and he just spent the weekend with uh, Roman Laporte. So uh, I'm pretty sure that that will uh, that will be a good sort of offset for his uh, his journey. Yeah, right. this is my favorite piece of his. So we we featured him last week, which yep. brought him to my attention because somebody else picked him. Oh. Um, with that bust with the yellow background, and, and then I just good. checked out his stuff, and this is my favorite by far. Mm-hmm. I thought, mm-hmm. yeah, this this is perfect. I love mm-hmm. it. And this is one of those ones I'd love to show people. We're like, do you think this is cool? They were yeah. like, yeah, it's a miniature. Oh, no, yeah. it's not cool anymore. It's a miniature. Miniatures are lame. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I just think, yeah, it's perfect. Um, it, it's very really cool. fun. It, it's a piece that that signals miniature art mm-hmm. more than miniature toys so it's mm-hmm. a uh, sort of challenge to get non-miniature people interested into miniatures yeah yeah absolutely i love the color palette i love the style mm-hmm. um it's just great and uh, i think we'll probably refer back to this when we do our uh fuck smoothness episode which i want to <laughs> do and because yeah. uh, I'm going through a personal journey with that at the moment, and um, <laughs> and also yeah, the is miniatures art. We still haven't done that, yet, but uh, no, this is going to go in there. It needs yeah. to because it feels it feels like for me personally of late that there is a lot more like that. Maybe it's just me because we're noticing it more, or it feels like there's a lot more pieces cropping up that do kind of bridge that gap. Mm. Yeah. Um, lately uh, i don't know what it is but it's fantastic but yeah it just feels like they're more prevalent now so it's a hell of a time maybe we should book in that episode i think that, is something that a lot of people have been wanting to do for a long time and once the the levies get breached and once some people are, are starting to do it it gets more legit- legitimate and that means that more people will feel encouraged and confident enough to do it as well i think that's yeah. a really, really good uh, really good place to be Mm. I agree. Yeah, it did. It took a few people. I think mean, you're one of them to it, but and now it's it's becoming way more accepted. And I think yeah. certain shows it won't be accepted, but mm. yeah, it's getting there. Um, yeah, very hard thing to balance mm-hmm. the technical and the artistic with with judging. And uh, yeah, it, it, but it's, it's, it's cool. I think it's really interesting how it's going to change the way that things are judged, isn't it? Because it's not something we've seen a lot of at certain shows. We've seen some of it in the past, but it becomes more prevalent. Mm-hmm. It's going to have to alter the way that things are judged at shows because it's going to be more. There's going to be more of it, and it's going to it's going to influence it in some way or another. So it's really interesting to see how that's going to kind of progress and work out. I think how judging at shows because it always we've talked about it before. It naturally progresses dependent on what's prevalent within the community at the time so i think it's going to be really interesting to see how this if this is a full-on stage almost like we're going through so like if, just as an example you go back to like a few years ago and everything in gd was like that highly reflective armor whatever it yeah. was shiny then, marine shiny <laughs> marines yeah so it'd be really interesting to see if at some shows we start to get this sort of really artistic colorful uh phase of miniatures painting come through and how that kind of alters I mean, the, ex- the expo showed that, I think, really. The World Model mm. Expo was like, yeah. you got three, three years of people just sharing on Instagram, and then the pieces that turned up after that three-year break were just very different in a in a yeah. really positive way. I think this was at the expo. Yeah, it um, was. It was. Yeah. Mm. I think he won, he won a gold in the standard, so he's ready yeah. for master for sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, for me personally, I mean, we, this is an episode we're getting into, so I'll try and not go on a tangent. <laughs> I find myself very unhappy with painting only because of the technical stuff. And I think that's sad that I get I don't like my own work because it's got lumps and bumps in. And I just mm-hmm. think it shouldn't matter. And I'm mm-hmm. just too, too conscious of people going, oh, there's a lump in that. That means it's terrible. And I'm like, it's not though, is it? So I'm just going through that personal journey myself and uh, yeah. getting annoyed. So it's interesting <laughs> to see judging on these sort of pieces, mine as well, for that matter. That mm-hmm. normally judging is based on sort of the very basic level of judging is about technical uh, uh, skill prowess, technical mm-hmm. perfection, yeah. and then you can you can get better and better prices the better you are at technical perfection. And some competitions weigh that very heavily. Some of them are more sort of in between. But this one, this sort of stuff, 
it doesn't really care about that technical stuff. There's a lot of technical stuff in, in this piece, but it's a very different kind of technical stuff. It's much more about how you use the colors and what to do where. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of it's sort of just telling that whole uh, uh, old established meta that is just playing a different tune. That's what I always call it the meta. I'm like, yeah. screw the painting meta because it is there is a painting meta that people yeah, think it's... they have to to do. I mean, when people like comment on my stuff saying you missed an edge highlight, I'm just like, get out of town. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think I think that. Again, this is the other episode, but there's there's just a balance, and it's there's if there was a metric, it's like you can get away with low technical if the creativity and the beauty is ten out of ten. Yeah. Yep. But but if you combine technical beauty things like someone like Albert, then of course that should win the best prizes because it's got all things. But then yeah, so there's always and then something might not be that creative, that technical, it sits in the middle and not do that well. But um, yeah, all on balance, but. I think if you weight it too heavily towards any criteria, you're never going to get a nicely balanced um, sort of prize pool, are you? So mm. very true. But yeah, that's definitely an episode to uh, to come. I think. Got yeah, to we should it. move on. We should. Yeah. What's <laughs> next, Matt? Before we go to so deep. next up is <coughs> it's oh. me. Uh, I thought this was bloody mental, to be honest. <laughs> um, it's Anna, and I think she did this for uh, a book for AK, which is all female artists. I think this was the piece she did for it. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I just think this is an amazing uh, example of painting light on a miniature. I think my favourite part is the back, <clears throat> because the back is still rendered, but with that really well-judged, cold, softer light, and that purple against the warm yellow side is just, very well balanced but not overpowering i just think it's all very well judged um yeah and i just don't think i've quite seen a piece mm, like that to be honest it just really stood out to me um and i thought yeah fantastic and there's some other really technical stuff like we just talked about like i think that's some freehand work and things there's just mm. loads going on in this um, i love the um the light against the wood on the door it's good isn't it? yeah. it's a good yeah. it's a good piece it's a very good piece cool, man. Um, so different like you said yeah she's pretty low-key amazing as well like don't see much of her work she used to, i think you used to see a lot of her work back in the cool mini or not days because she would do like crazy mm. she do like a blood angel dreadnought with loads oh, of i remember hair. that like, mm. yeah that was and such then, a good dreadnought man and people would care about that, but she's not painting as much DW, so it's probably not getting spread around. But I think this is, I'd like to see this in real life, but I, I love it. It really stands out. And it's, um, it's the sort of thing I like, like some kind of extreme lighting, but uh, pretty realistically done, I think. So, yeah, this was my jam for sure. Nice. Good choice. It's very what cool. What should we next do the next one? So next up is... My one. <laughs> it's got to be a Marine. <laughs> it's got to be a Marine. You can't have an episode about it. It's got to be a Marine. We're I've a balanced been... podcast here. Yes. <laughs> equal equal representation. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm properly just itching to, to get going on the World Eaters because I just want to yeet my Golden Demon entry out the window at the moment. So I've just Same. been following <laughs> and just... <laughs> What's the count at the moment, Matt? What we got left? Where's your cock? Uh... <laughs> 24 days. 24, 24 days. days. Well, I'm Four going hours. away for 10 of them, so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm really itching to get going on the World Eaters. Um, got my my additional grabby hands from, from Taro that turned up for the Dreadnoughts. And yeah, I just, I love this. This is kind of like the style of world eaters that I want to do, like that. If I could get anywhere close to that, I'd be very happy. <laughs> You're going to use some oil washes. Sorry? Are you going to use oil oil washes? Oh yeah, oil washes. Yeah. There's going to be filters, just chipped and yeah. blood, and just going to be so much fun and mess and no technical nonsense and just. Mm -hmm. 
it's going to be messy hey, battle, fun. Battle damage is technical, Matthew, all right? Yeah, but it's Do fun you know, technical. Battle damage is, is a skill, all right? <laughs> battle damage That's is an art. Good. I've got some transfers for you as well, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, you need. I'm, I'm gunning for it it's gonna be fun so i'm super happy and i'm happy i found this because i want to do that style of blue nice yeah. good pick. yeah that's good good picks everybody nice uh do we have a meme no meme we, we do not have a meme that's fine so we'll move on to our main segment so we're going to talk about art and something called dogma 48 with our good friend tui here so for those of you that don't know tui uh, can you just sort of introduce yourself a little bit and just explain to us, please, what is Dogma 48? Um, so, yeah, I've been painting miniatures for a long, long time. Uh, and I, I started in, the, in Golden Demon in 99. Uh, and yeah, I've, I've, yeah, I've been painting miniatures for a long time. I've changed my view on it quite a few times and mm. well for starters i i mostly build miniatures but in order to show off miniatures you had to paint them because the <laughs> show off miniatures would be in golden demon so you had yeah. to paint them so that's kind of how i got into painting because it was just a requirement for for being recognized um wow. and i had a, a long uh a long relationship with the Golden Demon, and I ended up being fairly disillusionized about the whole the whole deal, mostly because I wanted something more social. Um, mm. And luckily, I got to to attend one of the very last uh, German Golden Demons, and I think that was sort of the savior of me going to shows because the German Golden Demon was much much more. Um, much more sort of a gathering of friends rather than a hardcore competition. Mm. Um, and it's that kind of thing that I've been chasing ever, ever since. And mm. my, my focus is, is short of, my focus now is more about teaching people and trying to spread my mindset about what you can also do with ninjas. I know that there's a lot of different opinions about how to do miniatures and what to do with them. Uh, if you ask some of the hardcore Golden Demon guys, you'll have one very different explanation than if you ask me or if you ask Rusto or uh, Woman Apart or any, any of the other guys. So I think everyone has their own journey and I'm trying to open doorways for people to go down that they wouldn't necessarily have thought of or had the courage to do. Um, so I'm bringing miniatures to shows and I'm painting miniatures in order to show a different way. Mm. Um, yeah. So I think it, you've done that for a long time, really. You know, we were with the striking scorpion Wraith Lord came up on the internet the other week yeah. Yeah. and uh, sparked yeah. some. Very interesting conversations in many different direc directions, oh, yeah. um, but I, I found that very interesting, both the positive and the negatives. But I remember being very, like, I think it, I think you entered that before I was hobbying, while well, I was in like a mini break, and I remember mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm going to be back in the hobby. Let's look at what's won the last couple of years, and I was just like, that is the best idea. <laughs> like, I just <laughs> love everything about it, and you got all this other stuff that's like well painted whatever but that creativity i think is um kind of what sums up your stuff and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah just before obviously meeting you at, at monty and knowing you for a few years now mm -hmm. uh, i just just knew that wraith lord and remember mm -hmm. googling to find more stuff and and the, there was we just you just couldn't you're like okay so wraith lord by tua kai let's google nothing <laughs> yeah, that, that's you're a, an enigma. Fairly common thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting better. You've got Instagram now, so oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah true. And I'm updating it very, very slowly, but I am updating it. Uh, I'm trying to be more. Um, I'm trying to be easier to find. So basically, I've been putting off the whole Instagram and social media thing for a long time because. For a long time, it was enough to just bring your miniatures to the shows. 
and other mm-hmm. people would just take pictures of it and it was just sort of disseminate through the community and people would see it. But mm-hmm. after the pandemic, I think a lot of the uh, social mechanics of how miniatures are shown and consumed have changed a lot. Mm-hmm. So I've encountered many people uh, both on uh, Twitch and Instagram and all over the place who had never seen my stuff. And since I want to show people my stuff in order to open gateways for them to walk down, I need mm-hmm. to be very visible. So I have to do the uh, the whole thing again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So Dogma 48. Yes. Um, so we are running a workshop in Copenhagen called Chromonaut. And we opened that one in order to have a dedicated place to paint miniatures, a dedicated place to uh, try and explore miniature art. Um, and we wanted to do sort of an, an event for the community. Many, many different communities do like local painting competitions and that, that kind of stuff. But if we wanted to do a local painting competition, we wanted to do, well, we have a really strong Danish community and the, the Danish community get around a lot. So the, the biggest gathering of Danish painters in one place would be Monte San Savino once a year. So if we did just a local competition, people would just bring the stuff that they, they would take to the bigger competitions to our small one. Mm-hmm. And that would make the small one kind of pointless. So we wanted to yeah. do something different <clears throat> for the community. Um, so on a trip to Berlin uh, to see uh, uh, Ben Comets, uh, my friend Miguel and I and Ben came up with the, uh, the idea of the, the Dogma 48 event. Um, so the idea is that you have 48 hours to do a miniature from, from a very, very unfinished stage to a completely finished stage. And it was sort of inspired by those last 48 hours up until a competition, which is just a <laughs> map for the finish line. Yeah. Be mad. We've all uh, been there. But, yep, yeah, I think most people have tried that. Yeah, I see a, not, a lot of nodding heads here. Um, yeah. But if you don't make the deadline, the punishment is that you don't get to bring your models to the show. Yeah. But you are very, very focused and very good at what you do in those 48 hours. Uh, you prioritize and you you think about the project in a very different way because you have such a hard motivating deadline. Mm. And we wanted to do that, but in a softer setting so that if you run towards the finish line and don't make it, it's not, it's not a, a, you don't get punished in that way. You, you can't just take it out again and finish it. But it needs to be about making that journey to the finish line. And it's, it's amazing how much you can actually get done, get done in a weekend. It's amazing how uh, the people around you uh, reinforces your work ethic. Mm-hmm. ethic. It's, it's crazy how... Um, so normally if you don't really know what color to paint this or how to do that. Normally you would just um, go make a cup of coffee and uh, watch some videos and get away from it. But you don't have time to do that. You just need to get on with it. And then you would ask your mate beside you about what he thinks and ask if anyone has some ideas. And if no one has any idea, you just have to try it. Yeah. So all the all the normal faffing about that takes a lot of time out of the project, you just skip that completely. And you get really, really effective. And you need to prioritize what you do. So if you want to do a, a if you want to do a miniature with a mechanical arm, then you could spend 10 hours building a mechanical arm. But you could also just keep the normal arm and put some tubing on it and paint it silver colored. And that would also communicate mechanical arm. 
Mm. So is it actually worth those 10 hours? And those kind of decisions is what you have to make mm. during Dogma 48, but it's also what you learn to make for your other projects. I think that's what we, it goes back to what we're talking about, stimulated by the owl piece. And I, for me, I think what takes the time is, is sometimes the technical aspect. And that, that, that I think is irritating because you, sometimes you want to just translate an idea across. Mm -hmm. And I feel, I feel I can do all the main work fast. Then like, oh, people on the internet are going to moan if this isn't blended perfectly because everything has to be perfectly blended and neat and tidy. But the idea shouldn't, you know, doesn't necessarily mm. take that long to do. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think not having time to refine and neaten stuff is is refreshing and mm -hmm. sounds mm -hmm. sounds more appealing to me. Um, I think most of the time you don't have to refine everything. Mm. Most of the time you can just refine ten percent of the model, and that's enough. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. I think it's, it's interesting. That, it's not that I want to skip or skimp or be lazy. But if you only spend like half the time on doing a project, you can do two projects. Yeah, <laughs> it's very true. I think it's interesting how as painters, a lot of the time, I think we get in our own heads about stuff because we have so long, all painting projects don't have an end date. I mean, you might have a competition coming up that you want to enter for, but then yeah. if you don't, it's not the end of the world, you could enter the next one or the next one or whatever it is. Yeah. But I think having too much time to put into piece can also be a bit of a, a burden at times because you're never, sure. gonna paint, you're never going to paint something perfectly. If you ever paint anything perfectly, snap your brushes, flip your table and walk away because you're done with miniatures painting. Because if, but if you've got the time, you'll always strive to do it a bit better, a bit better, a bit better. And I think that itself can be a bit of a crippling aspect of it because if you've got a set period of time, what you paint in that set period of time, that has to be what it is. I think there's something quite freeing about the fact, like, I've got two days to do this. When it's done, it's done. Whatever yeah. it is, that's as it will be. Um, yeah. So I think it's, I bet that's quite challenging. Do you think for people that do it for the first time, they get quite thrown by it, by the 48-hour window? Or do you reckon it's something that can be freeing? Or do you think you see the breadth of, of all of that? So Dogma 48 is a completely open event. If you want to go, you can go. And yeah. no invitationals or anything like that. It's for yeah. everyone. And we have all kinds of people. We have um, we have people who's been in the miniature painting painting game for many, many years. And we have people who only do uh, these kind of projects at Dogma 48. Mm -hmm. And when you go there the first time, normally you you aim your aim for what you can do in a weekend is really bad. So either you, <laughs> you, you go way, way above what you can, or you can go way below what you can. So it takes a few of them to actually sort of hone in on what you can do and what you can't. I mean, uh, I think I have about a 50% completion rate or something like that. Okay. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't make the, uh, the finish line, line every time. And sometimes I just change my mind about what was the finish line. Uh, mm. I sculpted a an astronaut bust uh, some years ago, um, and the intention was, yeah, yeah, that that's the one. And the yeah. intention was to sculpt it in one day and then paint it in one day. But I sculpted it almost completed in one day, but I didn't want to rush it. I, I liked it so much that I didn't really want to just rush through it and give it a, a really rushed paint job. So essentially I made it into like a Dogma 36 or something. And then <laughs> a lot of hours doing a lot of detail work on it. Uh, and then the the finished project would be the sculpt instead. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd be happy with that after a weekend. <laughs> I mean, Jesus Christ, yeah. You, but that's you, cool because sculpting is a thing in its own right. So I think, yeah, mm -hmm. for, for me, I'd, if I was attending Dogma 48, if someone just did something as wonderful as that uh, and just to sculpt with no paint on, then that would be cool. And one thing that's amazing about seeing a traditional sculpt is the, the different materials, you know, when you've used metal parts to get that yeah. perfect yeah. wire, is this just something about? And Or if you use, like different putties I don't know I just think they're always amazing to look at 
and I'd be happy to look at this in the green as much as with paint mm. on, to be honest. It's a creation. And seeing how it was created with the metal parts is as important as, as a paint job, really. Yeah, um, Mark Mustlands ended up putting paint on that one. And it, it yeah, he did no. all right. He's not bad, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's how, um, okay, I guess. How sleep deprived do you get? <laughs> uh, not so bad anymore. Uh, so the the first Colbert Dogma 48, I, I got really, really sleep deprived. And by now I've... I settled on practice that I know I can make in a certain time, and I build in a, a sleeping sleeping mm. routine in that. So one of the things that you really learn is that sometimes you don't do your optimal work now. It's just better to sleep six or eight hours and mm. then do work. So with the 48 hours, do you get... Right, we're starting, this is the end date, and you can do what you want with the time in between. So if you, like you said, you want to sleep for a few hours, you can. If you don't, like, how does it work? Yeah, yeah. So in the start, we, we got, it started out being uh, relatively rough on, you need to arrive with the uh, models and screws, and you need to start from absolutely zero. And many <laughs> people do that. Too. But some people get intimidated by that, and mm. attend because they get intimidated. And we don't want to scare people away from that. So essentially, if you, it's very important for the event that everyone is in this sort of creative cocoon. Like everyone has a really, really hardcore focus. So if someone comes along and just paints some miniatures in a project that they've been painting all along, it sort of takes something away from the other people who are there. Yeah, I, yeah I can see that. You need to have that shared deadline. Mm. So everyone yeah. needs to work on projects that are geared towards that deadline. But how close to the deadline you want to start is up to you. So if you want to arrive with a primed bust, that's fine. You can do that. Mm. If you want to arrive with two sticks of putty, you can do that as well. And most people do somewhere in between those two. Well, I guess that for me, what I was just thinking then while I'm talking about, what matters about this weekend is the creativity and cleaning mold lines and assembling isn't creative. So mm. if I was like, I'm going to use this figure and do a scene with it, I would want to, you know, clean all the stuff off that miniature because that isn't a creative process. I'd want it, and and that's I don't know. I guess how I would like to start an event like that. Just there's go get a, creative. There's a pitfall there. So if you if you settle on a project, it it still needs to be a little bit flexible. Mm. So if it's you do say the same work yeah. on composition and targets, and if you if you get too settled on what you want the creativity sort of evaporates and it just becomes manual labor during the weekend. And mm. then you miss out on a lot of the, uh, I don't know, happy accidents. Uh, a, a lot of the things that you could learn, you don't get to learn because mm. you've already settled on a route. Mm. Being more flexible is a good idea. I do see the point in removing some... Uh, uh, some more lines, but just off the miniature, right? And then all yeah. the every, yeah. nothing else planned. But I'm going to do something around this character. At yeah. least get the old lines off, and then all the yeah. scene could could happen around it. That's that's how mm. I'd imagine doing it. Like yeah, no, no, if, no set plan. If, um, if, if you do that, you're already settled on what miniature to use mm. and what not to use. Mm. And if you, if the piece would be better if you added a secondary character you might not want to add that secondary character because then you need to remove the mode lines on that one. So <laughs> as long as you, as soon as you start doing work on, on your thing, you have already closed some of the doors. Yeah. How do you, do you have a set one each year that you come in at like a set level? Do you, or do you change it each year? Like, I know you said you were sculpting this, this burst, like one year, like you said, you turn up with two sticks of putty or do one year do you bring like a half built model? Do you have a set idea or does it change dependent on the year? Um, most of the time I decide on my idea like the day before. So cool. I had a specific idea up until two days before the uh, before the event last time. 
but then I was fortunate enough to get a Golden Demon ticket. Uh, still looking for Golden Demon tickets, by the way. So if anyone has, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got a Golden Demon ticket, and if I got a Golden Demon ticket, obviously I needed entry. So I I put aside my planned entry and did something else for Golden Demon. Ah, amazing. But it's very common for me to change what I do quite drastically through the uh, through the week through the weekend. So You're such I, a free have... spirit, it's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, the big game hunt, I think you have a picture of that one as well. The uh, the mm -hmm. beast that's been shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, like early on the same day, I had settled on the Forge World miniature for the robot guy. Yeah. But I thought the rest of the scene would be a bigger robot in sort of a, a Victorian showroom. Oh, wow. And I, I couldn't get the backdrop plinth to work for that. So I could only do the, the wide backdrop. And that informed the rest of the scene completely changing to what I have now. <laughs> so the idea was to use the little, the little robot guy and the little um, uh, men guys. Uh, with the tall hats, uh, but the rest of the scene was just completely changed. And I think I changed the rest of the scene like an hour before we started or something. <laughs> so it needs to be very fluid and very artistic and very alive mm. for it to have its impact. Mm. And it's it's a very special event, especially to me. Uh, and it's I heard some I heard some people saying that they don't want to travel all the way to Copenhagen just to uh, sit and paint miniatures for a weekend. And that's not at all what, what it's about. I mean, if you go to the event and don't finish anything and hate what you end up with, it's still a good event. It's still a successful event because what you want to get out of it is all the knowledge and all the learning that comes from that. It's yeah. not about the finish, the finish miniatures. It's about what you learn along the way. Mm. It's, it's almost like there's a few, yeah, there's a few different like, events like that, and that are quite, they're, they're very special. So mm -hmm. like, I always class Monty as one of those as well. That's that's a, that, that for me, it's yeah, it's a competition, but it's just a community gathering. And yeah. we, we like the miniatures are cool, and the ceremony is cool, and congrats to all the winners and all that. But it doesn't. I go and I never enter because mm -hmm. I don't. It doesn't bother me about the entering. I like to go and just soak up. You know, seeing all those brilliant miniatures with everybody and catching up with people that you haven't seen for a few years and just hanging yeah. out in the cafe next to the, the castle, or having a few beers, that kind of thing. Yep. So I think, yeah, that's a very good thing to, to and something that if you've not been to painting competitions before or events, if you go to someone, I would suggest everybody go to them if they can, that, that they are worth traveling for, for special ones. And there's certain ones that you, yep. you it becomes so much more than a miniatures competition or a painting competition or no competition or an event it becomes a lot yeah. more than that and i think dogma definitely fits into that that category here's mm -hmm. a, a good question from the comments when is the next one a mm. uh, dogma 48 is always twice a year and it's the second weekend of february and the second weekend of august so the next one would be february I think I'd be right up your alley, Rich. I think you'd smash it. <laughs> I think I would, actually. I was just thinking about that. I was thinking of so many different things. Oh, fuck, that would be great, because there's something I miss Especially about... Especially right now. Yeah, that, that would actually, to get you yeah. back on track, you need to yeah. not uh, be allowed to do anything else. <laughs> no butterfly. <laughs> yeah. no I'll tell you what, it, yeah. it appeals to me the most, because I, I get annoyed only getting to paint in little breaks. It's like... Oh, I finished work and I can paint for an hour. Then I've got to go do some other bullshit, and that's the only painting. And I can't get into it. I cannot get into it. Like I start painting, and then I'm like in the right direction. Oh, timer, adult, bye. And I'm yeah. so fed up with it. And just 48 hours with like-minded people, and I don't have any other tasks apart from painting is what I require right now, because, yeah, and I think, Rich, you're probably in the same same yeah. boat. Yeah, I think it, it, it's so appealing. It feels like an old school, like that, that, that idea of spending two days on a, just a project feels like kind of one of those old school painting projects that you'd have with your mates where you both get the weekend off and you're like, fuck it, I'm going to sit and we're going to get something finished. 
doesn't matter what. I don't care what it is. I don't care if I never use it. I want to start some. I want to get some finished this weekend. So for me, yeah, it definitely appeals in, in that vein of, of the feeling of the sat- sat- satisfaction feeling of going, I actually did this this weekend to completion, I think is, yeah, something that I, I might have to uh, go to that one and at some point. That'd be great. You'd be most welcome. That'd be fun. Um, so question wise, uh, again, so we've spoke a bit, a little bit that, you know, everybody's welcome, um, to the event, uh, where, where do you see it going? Like how many people do you get showing up to it? Does it vary? And um, what do you, what do you envision for it? You know, going into the future, what do you want it to become? So we have a hard cap because we, because the location is our workshop, there's a limited amount of seats for it. Uh, so <laughs> Most of the February ones, the February ones are always more uh, popular. And most of those, we hit the cap of 16 people. Yeah. Most of the August ones, we are around 10, 15 so. Um, but we are consistently getting more and more people going to these events. So mm. we're working on right now to make it, uh, make it more international, more open. Uh, so we are implementing more of a, uh, a an internet side of it. Uh, okay. We tried the last two of them uh, to do some live streaming. Uh, we're doing that way more in the future. Um, I'm speaking to two different camps who want to do their own uh, local ones. Uh, oh, cool. I really like it to be more sort of a, a global thing. Hmm. Because it doesn't take a lot to to organize it, and so the important thing with the event is to get people aligned in the right direction. Mm-hmm. So the the tricky bit is that if you if you run a workshop, if I go to another country and I teach something, um, I'm always there to steer the workshop. Yeah. So people start drinking a lot of beer, I can tell them to stop. If they start <laughs> painting something that isn't in the plans, I can tell them to do something else. Mm. But at Dogma 48, you don't really have that central figure that mm. can steer it. So if the event starts going off the rails, it's very difficult to steer it back. And Sounds great. <laughs> yep. Uh, and the quality of the event is sort of a, a social thing, and you sort of make the event for yourself and for everyone else. But for that to work, you need to get people put in the right direction for starters. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that demands a lot of communication about um, if you go here, you should aim for the Sunday uh, deadline instead of just going, well, I'll just start here and see how far it goes. You need to aim for that Sunday deadline. If you don't make it, it's not a big problem, but you need to go for that one. Yeah. Um, so I'm at the moment writing up a guide about how to arrange these things uh, and what to be really mindful of. Mm. Um, so I want, I want, yeah, I, I want to give this to the community. I want more people to do this thing. Mm. Um, and that's kind of where I see the future of it. Um, yeah, it, it's it's yeah. got many of the same motivations that, that I personally do about painting miniatures. That it's about the idea, it's about the um, it's about what you want to achieve rather than necessarily mm. over rendering and over detailing everything. It's more about the essence of the of the projects. And yeah, Doctor 48 has a lot in common with the way that I do miniatures. And yeah. I've learned a lot from Dogma 48. I've definitely gotten quicker at doing my my things uh, from going to all these Dogma 48 events. And I think that's something that can be uh, shared with a lot of people as well. I think looking at Big Game Hunter here, mm-hmm. it's, it's irrelevant that it was done in 48 hours. It's like a, it's a, a piece that I love. And I think everyone... Everyone that sees it goes, that's awesome. Not that's awesome for being done in 48 hours. And nobody mm. would even think about that, um, I, which, I is, even which is just great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you see this in a competition, you see this online and you go, 
that's a fantastic piece for these reasons. Uh, and it's just irrelevant. Um, and that's really nice. But the point you just said there about, you know, the important thing is getting the idea across. That's mm -hmm. what, yeah, that's what appeals to me because I feel mm -hmm. all the time is just, just rendering and, and doing the technical stuff. And actually it's just nice to get your idea in there. And I expect you feel very similar to that, Rich, because you uh, yeah. have a lot of ideas and you just want to realize them. And maybe, maybe it's something that you could just do <laughs> on your own to, to enjoy it a bit more yeah i think so i think i i suffer very badly from i just have an idea and i just want to see it realized but i have so many ideas if i spend too long on one idea it fizzles out and then the passion for it goes because i think of something else or i'm just not very good at spending a lot of time on miniatures it's just not something i particularly excel at so yeah the idea of having that time frame i think it sort of fits perfectly for how and also I, just an enjoyment level as well i enjoy picking something up working on it really intensely and then putting it down and stepping away from going cool that's done mm -hmm. i hate i hate how my painting's got at the moment that it's okay cool pick this miniature up, like you said andy work on it for an hour and a half come back to it four days later pick it up work on it for an hour and you a half. just like, can't I, can I you fucking hate it yeah mm -hmm. there's no passion like, for it, it just, yeah it just becomes like you said it becomes like monotonous and, and i'm doing this because i feel like i have to mm -hmm. so yeah definitely something that i think a lot of people, I think, would feel the same about that as well. So the idea of it being like an international <laughs> thing is amazing. It's, yeah, it's, it's, um, it'd be a hell of a thing to see it progress to that level. And, and hopefully it will, definitely. So with a piece like the, uh, the Big Game Hunt, the only thing that you really need to render is the, the red orange dots on the robot and some normal <laughs> stuff around the guy and the face of the beast. As long as those bits are rendered and as long as though those can stand up to you studying them and looking at them closely, the rest of it doesn't need to be. And if you don't render a lot of the, of the surface and you really render a small piece, that small piece will look even more sharp and even more rendered hmm. because the rest of it isn't fighting for attention. Yeah, very true. And I think very... Very, a very cool way of, of painting and I think that can be quite different to how we a lot of people that do paint for competitions and stuff about how we do paint because we are very used to paying for certain competitions this whole miniature from top to bottom from every angle from every point of view this must be rendered to 100 percent that's the meta isn't it yeah and that's what I'm per I'm personally very fed up with it and yeah. then there's pressures that I definitely put upon myself that I shouldn't mm -hmm. um and finally getting to a place out of frustration where i don't care <laughs> i just don't want to care if someone says it's crap because i want it to, i want it to look like this and i don't want to do stuff i don't enjoy anymore so it's like i'm going to leave this black with no painting on it because i like the look of it and so yeah. and yeah i'm just going to do that <laughs> now um but yeah i think I think it's important to mix it up and not always do things like that. But that's what, again, what, what Dogma 48 is, is amazing for is, yeah, you don't have time to do these boring things mm. that you, you, you can't fit the painting meta in 48 hours. Yep. You can only be creative and that, that should bring out a more important side. Uh, it it will force you to prioritize differently than you, you normally would. And that can teach you a lot about the, the way that you normally put together your projects. Yeah. I think you it's should definitely free. prioritize. Um, sorry, Rich. You should definitely, yeah, prioritize what's important to you. I think, and that's like, what if it's creativity or technical painting? But I think, don't prioritize what you feel you should in miniatures. Yeah. Mm. Think what what's important to you in miniatures. Um, yeah. yeah, that's something I'm only just <laughs> getting to grips with myself. I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there are certain painters that do prioritize technical ability and precision and, and all those kind of things. So for them, totally fine if, if that's not their, their cup of tea. But I think for people that are artistically minded and creativity minded, like a lot of painters are, uh, I think that's, it sounds like such a freeing, um, you know, thing to do to, 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 you don't even have to worry about the, the level of like, you know, how detailed it's going to be because it's just, just not relevant because you know, you haven't got the time. So, you don't even need to second guess how much time should I put into this bit, this bit, this bit. It just, it just sounds, yeah, very like a very freeing, fun thing to do. 
That actually just takes it back takes it back to just a bit of fucking creativity, not second guessing your ability to edge highlight or is this bit perfect? Is that bit perfect? Oh fuck, I've rubbed this bit off. I've got to do it again. Like it just bins all of that noise and just lets you actually fucking create something. Mm. I think both of us, I think we're in different places with what we want from the hobby. Yeah. Me and you, Rich, but this event would both achieve something that we need. Even yeah, though we, even though our goals are different, this this style of thing. So what yeah. I'm saying is I think we should go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we should, man. That'd be really good fun. Um, yep. Matt needs to so he doesn't have to paint all his bricks on his wall. <laughs> Don't no, yeah. I've had enough of them. I want to just <laughs> completely throw it out the window. I'm sick of it. <laughs> On a, we, on we've a had run. plenty of of, uh, of foreigners come to the uh, to the Dogma Forty Eight event, so it is a Danish event, but it's very much at the same time a uh, an international one. Yeah. Uh, we even have a, a number of tickets that are reserved for foreigners, oh, so right. that foreigners have a chance to get in on on the action. Uh, because cool. if we don't have that, uh, most of the time all the tickets just get taken up by the local community. But we want to include other people. Hmm. That, that, that doesn't sound like to a stretch. Whenever we meet you guys at all the events, you're the nicest group of people on planet <laughs> Earth. So not a problem at all. Uh, random question in the chat, Rich, where we see at Monty. There'll be a whole bunch of us from Court Paint at Monty. So we'll definitely be be there with, with a few of us taking photos and videos and stuff like that. Um, well, uh, Tui, whilst we're, we're talking about your fantastic Dogma 48, we've got to talk about some of the pieces. We're looking at the fantastic... One here, the hunt one. Uh, what are the standouts? Any favorite creations? Any bits that you you? Like, what were your standouts and why? Uh, of my own work, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So my own favorite one is my uh, my space camel, the, uh, the 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 weird alien uh, uh, walky thing with the orange backdrop. I think <laughs> that's. I love that. Um, <laughs> So whenever I bring my my collection, I have like five pieces that are sort of the core of what I want to show off. I did that for a, a World Model Expo. And people gravitate either, either to the a Space Camel or to the Big Game Hunt. Mm. And I think those are my two favorite pieces and for different reasons. So mm. Big Game Hunt is very simple. It's got one imperative, one thing that it really wants to push. And pushes that very hard. Um, so it's relatively simple in its method, and it's very easy to consume. You don't really need to know a lot in order to uh, feel like you're there. Uh, you 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 get sort of the ambience quite a, uh, straight away. Um, I like the space camel more because it tries to do a large number of very complex things. And I think it works. So it's the one that I is the one that I think was most risky in its method. Uh, there's a, a very very big portion of that miniature that is very rough. Um, a lot of it is sculpted, uh, is sort of intentionally rough. So there's there's large parts of it that hasn't got any detail at all. And I did that specifically to push focus towards the things that do have detail. Um, and it's relatively normal to do that with painting, at least now it is. Uh, it didn't used to be like that. And I haven't seen it done with sculpting before. So that's my favorite. It's the one that I like, like the most, but it's not everyone's favorite. I remember seeing it for the first time and seeing it from about like 20 feet away in a room and walking and what the fuck is that i'm walking up to it and it'd be like my god that's amazing just how bright and if you if you see it like on, on a bench of miniatures at a show it doesn't half stand out which is an amazing thing i love that yeah, piece it does and that's done specifically to do to to get exactly what you're talking about yeah. so miniatures should be uh, able to draw you in from a, a long distance most miniatures draw you in from like a meter or two I wanted yeah. to do that one more. Um, and it, it needs, when you get drawn into a miniature, it needs to have something else there as well. So it needs to have several different layers of interest. And 
there needs to be something for you to discover and something to see at every level. And if that one falls through, if if you do something that's really bright, but as soon as you get up to it and look closely at it, it's just shabbily done. It just <laughs> you, you mm-hmm. need to be able to deliver on all these different stages. And I think the uh, the camel does that. I think there's a lot to discover on the camel, probably more than the big game hunt. Um, mm-hmm. Because, yeah, I think I, I remember this piece and then the thing that stood out was just the, the feet. One set of feet is sculpted, like you said, softer. Yep. And you're like, why hasn't anyone done this before? In mm-hmm. photography, everyone's obsessed with bokeh and, and having things, yeah, you know, out of focus, soft and things like that. And why isn't, why isn't that done with miniatures? The obsess- I mean, I think that it comes from being a 3D medium and us being able to move it, that yeah. everyone's obsessed with everything, having the same level of rendering and, and detail and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But in a more two-dimensional piece like this, because you've got the backdrop in there, of course it makes more sense. Um, but yeah, I, think, I just think it, it, it's a piece where I first started to think about that and of course, with the painting as well, that if you paint everything in full detail and sharp, then everything's in the foreground. Mm. And you, you must start to think about not detailing things the same way. Uh, yeah, if you want to take attention away from stuff. So, yeah, that piece was really important for, for my mindset and starting to think about that as an idea. But I think what I like about Big Game Hunt is how depressive it is you know oppressive <laughs> um i think just the gray and then the you know the massive area of relief just the blank space on the side um that just i don't know hits hits more emotion for me i think mm-hmm. like the uh space camel is like um more of an impact amazing piece lots of things to discover in detail but um yeah this one hits harder for me on that kind of emotional level uh and that's kind of cool that two pieces two different to do two different things the the intention with the big game hunt was to try and i always argue that if if something is on a miniature and it doesn't serve a purpose it shouldn't be there mm. so it would be better to just not have that surface or to grind that part of the surface away. It's just better to have a blank surface than it is to have a detailed surface that doesn't contribute anything. Because a detailed surface that doesn't contribute anything just takes attention away from the stuff that you want attention to be at. Um, That's a very big lesson in one sentence there, lad. (laughs) Take take notes. (laughs) Yeah. So normally I always go for just condensation. So just cut away anything that isn't super necessary to only leave behind the stuff that is necessary. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my my uh, my most prevalent pet peeve is busts because yeah. most busts have about double the amount of material in them that you actually need. Busts Especially now, these days. It probably doesn't have legs. And there's just way too much stuff in these busts and it just dilutes the focus. With the big game hunt, I wanted to experiment specifically what you can achieve by adding extra space. Um, So if you look at the piece and imagine that the whole right side of it isn't there, it very quickly becomes a piece about these super cool guys who show. I wouldn't like it then. Uh, It it very much becomes about sort of heroic story about uh, winning against this beast. But if you add the entire other thing, uh, it has this empty feel. Uh, You get all this nature and you get this idea about what's left behind, about an ecosystem that doesn't have the apex predator anymore. It it gets a very different uh, feel and ambience when you add that extra space. Mm. So adding extra space can have a really good effect but you need to add the extra space with a uh, intention and with purpose mm. Mm. and the asymmetry is really important i think as well yeah, it is. um 
it's just very very not not easy to well yeah e- easy to do because to make to put the model on the left and not the middle is easy to do to go like that yeah, yeah. it's it's a very difficult decision but i guess if the blank space wasn't there then you could imagine oh maybe it's really busy in the rest of the scene but because there is this like dead area you're like wow this is a really quite a bleak world and the, <laughs> the gray just ooh, just really uh that oppressive feeling and that's what i like about it because i would i can't think of a piece that gives me that same feeling of emptiness um because it's always focused on this is a man with a sword and it's all bright, blah, 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 blah. It's neat and oh, it's neat and tidy, big whoop. Um, or or it's about or it's about where that person sits. If you think of 99.9% of the miniatures that we look mm-hmm. at, the, the the focus for that model, if it's on a plinth, if it's on whatever, if it's just on a base, it's front and center, isn't it? It's it, we, we draw everything's done in a central way, or the majority of things are done in a central way. But I agree, mm-hmm. I think it's one of the only miniatures, one of the only pieces I can think of that. You, by putting nothing in it, but still adding the nothing, it gives it so much more than if it wasn't there, which is kind of crazy to think about. Like you've basically extended the scene, but not, and you've painted it like the backdrop. You've not put anything in it, but by putting something in there with nothing in it, you've added a shitload to it. Well, it's narrative, isn't it? It's yeah. the, surround, the surroundings of this is bleak. And yeah. uh, I always think of pieces of like a snapshot, right? And you can imagine there's loads of other stuff going on it. And, uh, yeah, that's what's cool about backdrops and, and stuff like this, I guess. So uh, everyone's everyone's doing backdrops, but they're long and thin, and it's just a strip behind. But this yeah. kind of this kind of waiting is totally different. So yeah. mm, makes you think. If I can, if I can quickly just uh, say something about back, backdrops. Mm. I think you Go. Get <laughs> backdrops wrong at the moment. So most people paint backdrops and they paint the figures, but they paint them with equal amounts of intensity. So there's a lot of like uh, uh, lightning storms and uh, mm-hmm. brightly colored skies. And I, I, I know that I'm guilty of this as well. Uh, there's a lot of action going on. There's a lot of narrative going on in, in backdrops that you see around. So there's, yeah. And if you have the action going on, if you have narrative in the backdrop, and if you have narrative in the figure as well, those two things are going to compete. Mm. Same way that you want to do composition about where to put colors and where not to, you need to do composition about where to do narrative and where not to. Mm. So most of the backdrops that you see, they have really high value and contrast to jumps and they pull a lot of attention. And they pull that attention away from the figure. Mm. And you can do backdrops that do that, but then you do need to do subtle figures. You can't do super intense figures and backdrops because they will just compete and there's no winner in that competition. Uh, I've, I've been learning that lesson today too, because I've paid... <laughs> I've painted two backdrops today, yeah. and um, I'll I'll do a video talking about it. But I basically did a backdrop, and and it was too polished, too refined, um, and looked sterile. And it lost all the feeling. Um, in that quest of the painting meta is well, it's got to be blended well. It's got to be neat and tidy. And I used like the airbrush to smooth it, and it lost all the feeling. Mm. So I sp- sprayed it black and got a brush. And just started smashing mm-hmm. and it was a better feeling for me to do and also a better uh, aesthetic and yeah. it was just just a uh, a, a good lesson so i uh, agree with you it's something that happened go oh, on sorry. i was just gonna say it's something of what happened when i did my squad thing with the backdrop i was i did it like five times four of them were too too overindulgent, too detailed, and the fifth time it was just literally just I wanted a color just to set the scene, and that was it. Yep, yep. Simplicity for backdrops normally does the trick. Mm, yeah, I also feel that uh, I haven't seen your backdrops, obviously, but when you look at a miniature, you can see on that miniature if it was a joyful experience. 
So some some miniatures you can definitely see that that was not a, a labor of love. That was just <laughs> hard, hard slog. And some miniatures, it's really really clear that they are just joyful. Mm -hmm. It was a really, really fun and good experience, and that that's not necessarily connected to the ambience. The big game hunt, for instance, I had a lot of fun doing that, but it's not a very fun scene. Mm. But you can sort of see that enthusiasm in those miniatures. And if you if you paint a backdrop and you hate painting it all the way through, it's not going to end up well. Mm. I think, yeah, I, I, I stopped having fun doing the backdrop today because the quest was to make it refined or mm -hmm. whatever. And then... Yeah, Steinus, and then I had some lumps and bumps, and I was like, "Man, why do people care so much about having not not bumps in your paint?" I could just hear people going, "Oh, there's a lump in there," and I was like, "This is so I'm so bored of this." Like for 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 a gold, for Golden Demon, I, I like that it's technically focused. All right, mm -hmm. I think it's cool to have a contest that's this is what it is. There's only three winners. And we're going to focus on the highest technical standard. I think that's fantastic. So I'm never going to be negative about that. I think it's cool to have a show like that. And it's cool to have other shows where it's a bit freer, mixing it up. But uh, but yeah, personally, I, I guess I'm just fed up with that whole feeling that it has to be pristine to be good. For it to be worthy, yeah. Mm. It's mm. so labor intensive. Mm. And for the people who really, really lost that, I think it's awesome. Yeah. I personally think that it's um, Golden Demon isn't where I'm at at the moment. Golden Demon isn't really my thing. But mm. there's a lot of people who think it's fucking amazing. And I'm in a very lucky position in different shows that I can go to that wants to push the same thing that I do. So mm. I think it's perfect that Golden Demon is its thing and I have my thing. And if I try to change Golden Demon, not that it's ever going to happen, but if I could, I would take something away from all the people who really want that. Mm. And yeah, I mean, why why should we really? Because yeah. it's 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 such a fantastic thing, and I I, I kind of want it to stay like that. It's its own entity, and yep. for me, I feel I guess I go to every show, and I and I can't think of another person I see at them all. Like, I can't think of someone I saw at Chicago Golden Demon who was also at World Model Expo and, every, you know, who's going to be in the UK one and all, all these different things. Um, I just, just, just like them all. Um, but, yeah, I just think it's good to have these different things. But you're right that you shouldn't try and change stuff because it might ruin it for someone else. <laughs> exactly. I think there's definitely room for them all, isn't there? And I think even like you say, Andy, you, you do every show and some are more lean, leaning one way than the other. So there's even room within the shows for one person to, to lean into, right, this for the next six months, I'm going to paint something as neat as fucking possible because that's just the itch I want to scratch. And that's what I'll lean into this. And I can go to a show to demonstrate that. Whereas if it's if you're on a different journey with like you're painting, like with me at the moment, I can't think of anything worse than trying to sit there and paint something as like neatly as possible. So I'm leaning the other way and going, right, what can I explore this way with it? So I think, yeah, I think there's definitely breadth of of uh, shows for everybody to explore kind of what they want to do with it. Yeah. And it used to be in a way that like ten years ago we only had Golden Demon. Mm -hmm. And Golden Demon had the same focus. Yeah. And that was one of the things that, that turned me off in uh, miniature events because you only have one one venue. And mm. at the point, we have a, a wide variety of different shows that you can go to that want to achieve different things. I think that's awesome. Yeah, it is really awesome. And yeah. um, I'm, I'm mega excited. I mean, I'm, I wasn't sort of super happy that Golden Dean was October this year because uh, <laughs> I completely burnt myself out in March. Um, but you know, in the next couple of months, I've got Golden Demon with all the UK boys, and then UK boys going to Monty. Like both those weekends are going to be so fun. Completely different contests, different criteria, but they're going to be brilliant because they're going to have fantastic people at them. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's a funny one. But hopefully, hopefully we can see more creative pieces win. Uh, yeah, win some golden demons. Because you brought your library, didn't you, to a golden demon? Yeah, I did. I did. Do you uh, get a picture of that one, Matt? 
Uh, I don't have a picture at the moment. Probably find one. Yeah, I think that's a, a good kind of a good one to to finish talking about, really, isn't it? Because that was I, me and Rich saw that at Monty and uh, yeah. and that piece. I mean, if under the technical aspect, it's probably not going to win a Golden Demon, right? But I yeah. think what's really important is that it's there because that would probably affect more people than some winning pieces. Um, and something we always say is go enter Golden Demon. Oh, but I might not win. Well, only three people win the category. Yeah. So Don't even worry about go. it. You just got to go. <coughs> it's just always a good idea to bring a piece to a, con- a competition. Mm-hmm. It's always a good idea to go to a competition because you learn so much from it. And it's always a good idea to bring a piece when you go because you feel involved in a different way than if you didn't. So you might just bring something for fun, but someone might see it and get inspired. Someone might see it and really like it. Yeah, that's a one. There it is. So what did you create this piece for? Was this for a a show or one show or just, yeah, what was it for Monty? For for Monty. Cool. So it wasn't for Golden Demon. Uh, So about two months before Monty, I was feeling a bit buggered that I didn't really have anything to bring. And my friend, my friend Christian kicked my ass and told me to just make something. Um, So that piece was actually, uh, it was meant to be like a small skirmish war band. Uh, I had built about half of it and I just tore all of it off the bases and chucked them on the, uh, (laughs) uh, on the plinth instead. So, it was quite a slot to get that one finished. Uh, I actually, um, I went to Monty on the Tuesday before the show. And when I went to Monty, none of the figures were finished. The The walker in the middle was, and the backdrop was, but all the miniatures I had in, in a different uh, uh, carry case. They so you had... did your own Dogma 48? Oh yeah, before. oh yeah. There, there, was, there was a lot of painting being done in, in those days. Um, and actually I got one of the pitfalls when doing these big entries is that, uh, I think the, the wording that we use is that you work it until you hate it. And Mm. it's very common for that piece specifically. I was really, really not liking it in the end. I do like it now. But in the end, I could only see errors. I can only see the choices that I didn't take. That every might time, every choices. piece. Yeah. yeah. I felt that every single piece. <laughs> I was so disillusioned with that one that I actually wanted to put it into standard instead of master mm-hmm. because I just didn't believe in it. Well, I'll tell you my favorite bit, which isn't in the shot, but mm-hmm. another another small thing that had a massive impact on me was just the the holes left on the paper. <laughs> yeah. If if it didn't have that, it wouldn't affect me as much. But I just remember seeing those ripped holes, like it had torn out of a an art book, and I was like, Man, I don't know, I don't know what that's making me feeling, but it's making <laughs> me feel feel something uh, straight, you know, literally straight off a page. Um, and yeah, just that one idea is is super cool. And I've never seen that before. And that's that's really important. And I think, yeah, certainly I, I would never do it because it's, it's kind of been done. But just that mindset of creativity and, and you know, basically, fuck the matter. <laughs> Painting it's like, I'm going to do this piece of paper and leave the holes on it. Uh, I just think that's, yeah, really, really cool. <gasps> Yeah, and so I'm, glad, I'm glad you entered it. <laughs> the the no. point of that piece was to, uh, it, it's meant to be like a tribute to the uh, black and white illustrations from Games Workshop, mm. and it's meant to be like a a drawing come to life. Mm. So the backdrop is painted on on watercolor, just sketchy stuff, but some of the miniatures close to the backdrop is painted the same way. I painted oh, wow. the watercolor texture on some of the miniatures just to make a more smooth transition between the backdrop and the miniatures. Um, I painted on the cast shadows. That was not really done when I did this piece. Uh, 
but it it seemed like a natural thing to do for an illustration because you always paint on the shadows for that that's a good shot <laughs> i've not i've not seen that photo before uh, <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's those the the holes at the the top for me from the paper. I mm -hmm. think it it would completely change my personal feeling of the piece without them. To be honest, do you do you feel that way at all yourself as the creator? Um, it was a relatively random uh, a random thing that they that they made made it on there. Uh, so I did four or five different backdrops, and <laughs> I did all of those on, on different pieces of paper. And just constantly sort of tried one on and it wasn't quite what I wanted and tried another one on and that wasn't quite what I wanted. And all of those had those uh, uh, torn off pieces of, of, uh, of ribbing on, in the top. And it just felt completely natural to leave it there because <laughs> it communicates the idea of a, a sketchy sketchbook thing really well. So mm. whatever gets the idea across the finish line is what you should do. Mm. Yeah. Um, Some big, big so, life lessons in this episode too. Yeah, I, I, I want to write, I want to write, and I'm going to go back and I'm going to write down to his quotes and I'm going to put them because <laughs> there's some, some really massive ones. I think we should do a summary of, to be honest, because they're yeah, huge. We should, we should be doing some uh, uh, inspirational talks for, for miniatures painters. You know, you have those inspirational quotes on Instagram. Like making money and shit, you should do them for miniatures painting. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. There's some uh, uh, some surfaces on the uh, uh, the space camel. Uh, so I used some uh, some injection molded plastic bits on some of it, but some of them were in locations where I wanted that rough sculpted stuff. So I ended up grinding away some of the injection molded plastic. And sculpting on rough detail and removing detail here and there. Too smooth. <laughs> because that's what the piece needed. So mm. it's what you should do. Well, I, I feel um, I feel very inspired just having this chat. And uh, <laughs> and I kind I of you go on, Rich. I just wrote a pencil with a backdrop now. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, I feel better about mine. I know I know the way <laughs> to go. I or, I already rescued it. I, I painted it bad. And I didn't finish it, but I got it in the right direction, a lesson learned. But talking in two ways really helped uh, with that. And I realised how many pieces have had a big impact on me now, starting with the Striping Scorpion Wraith Lord. But, yeah, done some quite good models, haven't you, really? It's quite... <laughs> yeah, you've, you've done a couple in your time, haven't you, mate? And it makes me really happy to hear you say that, because it means exactly what I aim to do. Exactly... Uh... Uh, I, I want to inspire, uh, inspire. I want to show people a different route. Um, and it seems like it's working. And that makes Definitely. me happy. <laughs> Definitely, mate. Definitely working. Right. We have been talking about this for a while. We need to continue. So uh, <laughs> we are going to close out the show with our regular session of um, hashtag paint cultists. So if you've not been following us for very long or you're fairly new, uh, here we have a hashtag, which is paint cultist. Uh, it started off fairly small, but now there are thousands upon thousands of uh, miniatures that are tagged with paint cultists. So thank you very much for tagging yourself and all these. Please keep doing it. Uh, we look at them all uh, and we pick a few each uh, each podcast uh, to have a look at to see what you guys have been getting on in your own miniatures world. So let's have a little look at what we've got on paint cultists this time. Oh, starting off with the best legion. Did you pick this, Rich? <laughs> I didn't. I swear to God. These are temporary. I didn't pick any of these. I probably he picked didn't. it for you. Give you an easy time. I mean, he absolutely did, because that's that's perf that's absolutely perfection as the meme. Uh, if you could just replace my face with that meme right now, perfection. There you go. How do you feel well, about then. this backdrop as well? Yeah, I like it. 2A, what about the backdrop? <laughs> it, it's very harmonic with the piece, and it sort of sets a good ambience, a good scene. Uh, it works really well with the figure. Like it. <laughs> is, it some, is it a jumper or something? I look, yeah. <laughs> a nice like fleece. Best Legion. Does look a bit woolly. Job. Dirty <laughs> as fuck. Love it. Good work. Yeah. Big up. Next up is... What have we got next? Oh, wow. Oh. Wow. 
to it. I think you could uh, kick us off on your thoughts on this. What do you think? <laughs> so uh, when the sculptor uh, released this one, I actually wanted to get one, but it's pretty big. So I ended up not getting one because, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I wanted one that was smaller, but I think it's yeah. really, really good. I think the red backdrop is a really powerful contrast to the very desaturated miniature in the, in the middle. Uh, so there's a, a little bit of blue value, a little bit of orange value in the skin, uh, but there's not a lot of color on the miniature itself. So doing a backdrop that is a very contrasting backdrop is really good for that one. Um, I quite like how the backdrop has a shadow side the same way that the face has. Even yeah, that's clever. It's just a, a flat surface. Uh, mm. It obeys those rules of where the, the light is coming from. Yeah, it's quite oh, bold. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not entirely convinced. Said, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely convinced of the the sort of a, a white spike just under one of the eyes, mm. uh, and that doesn't really communicate the the shape to me, at least. But it might just be, it might be very different uh, in real life. But I really, really think that it's a good piece. I like the, that it's not a black background, right? Could have just photoed it on black background. Black background doing all the work, but yeah, I think that's really cool. You'd lose too much <laughs> on the on a pure black background. It would just disappear. Yeah. Not if you yeah. Photoshop it, Matt. Contrast up. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody contrast slider. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of the the Batman aesthetic is about the uh, the the horns or the ears. Oh. And that backdrop is a really good, uh, it highlights that really well. Mm. And, a, and a black backdrop wouldn't do that. It would just disappear. True. Nice. Good work. Good work. What else we got? Ooh, nice. White Very scars. clean. Scars that are white. I love them. I love white scars. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if Henry likes them anymore after doing 40 <laughs> of them in about a week. But, uh, <laughs> I think I think they got they got the luckiest with the helmets as well. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's, let's not talk about the Space Wolf helmets. I'll tell you what's good, right, is when I was young, there was a White Scars Army and White Dwarf. No one did it because ah. the knowledge sharing wasn't there. And yeah. what's kind what's kinda cool is you get so many more White Scars Army because people were there's more knowledge out there, YouTube videos, whatever. But people do stuff like yellow armies, white armies. But yeah, honestly, when I was young, no, no one did them because it wasn't possible. Uh, yeah, it always was. Yeah. Just yeah. so I don't know. I just I only just thought of that then. But it's like I'm seeing quite a few white scores army. That's cool. That uh, this is now approachable because there's a much better sharing of knowledge, and that's why the hobby's moving forward so much. So that's kind of cool. And things like airbrushes are a lot more prevalent in people's arsenals of tools to, to, to create things. Yeah. Nice. So what else we got? Next up. Ah. Very good. Like Saw this. this and shared this earlier mm -hmm. in the week. Uh, great model, great paint job. Really nice guy as well, actually. Um, Chat to him on Instagram. So, yeah. Yeah, good shamefully, I think he said he uh, took some inspiration from a tutorial on, on the farce here I did, but he's done it about a million times better than my, my farce here. <laughs> uh, Ultimate did... compliment, mate. Ultimate compliment. I was like, oh, yeah, I, I won't ever let you see mine. This is much better. <laughs> I, um, I did the freehand like this on the back, and it's one of the worst freehands I've ever done, I think, but he's absolutely smashed it. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I love this colour palette. Um, you know, turquoise, purple, black absolutely love it and i love fairly desaturated purples and not particularly rich golds i don't know there's a lot of things on it i really like elder are the best um yeah and i just love it really, really good yeah it's really it's nice one of those paint jobs that that sort of pulls you in because the the longer you look at it uh, the more details you discover mm -hmm. and the more sort of oh so there's that one and that one and that one and sort of it just delivers on so many different layers. Very yeah. Cool. I'm well. looking forward to seeing more of them. And Elder are the best. 
yeah. Had to get that in there, didn't you? I'll die on the bus. Um, yeah. Two A agrees. It's cool. Yep. yep. <laughs> Brilliant. What's next, Matt? And last one. Last one. Oh, here we go. Aha. I wish we had more of these in stock. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think someone did these on a Dogma once. Want this model? Um, maybe. Probably. I mean, we've had like 15 Dogmas with maybe 12 or 14 people on each one. There's a lot of Dogma pieces to keep track of. <laughs> you, should do a dogma, you should do a Dogma book. Yeah. Uh, ah, I spoke well, to one of their book a long, long time ago. And yeah. that that killed any joy that I might have about doing books. <laughs> Get Matt to do it. He'll give you a spreadsheet. Yeah. yeah. Make Matt, spreadsheets. Matt the Dogma <laughs> Compendium coming soon <laughs> to Instagram. <laughs> it it um, would be really, really nice to have them. Yeah. But it's just cool to see this bust. I uh, haven't seen one in a while. And yeah. Um, yeah, I love it. It's really nice to see them still getting painted. I wonder if they bought it at the time and just got round to it. I'd love to know the story. You know, you <laughs> sell you sell these models and you see two painted. It's kind of crazy. Uh, but actually, this this figure, to be fair, is the most the the figure from Cult of Paint that I've seen painted the most. Um, yeah, yeah. Some you don't see very many of, but I've seen loads of this, which is super cool. So maybe it says a lot about simple stuff that's achievable and that goes hand in hand with dogma that uh yeah achievable in a time period is just very important than those massive overbearing projects i mean that that figure is it's clean enough to be able to to hold up to a really simple paint job whereas some of the figures especially the digitally sculpted ones they're so detailed that it just just the sheer amount of detail and real estate that you need to cover, uh, it just takes a lot of time. And this one is just really good, really simple. Nice. Amazing. Is that our last one, Matt? Yep, that was it. Cool. Brilliant. So, guys, you can follow us and you can see us all on our social medias. If you've got on our Instagram, if you tag yourself in the Paint Cultist. Uh, we will be putting links to everyone that we featured today in the uh, episode description. So please, if you have any questions, if you want to get in touch with us all, that is the best place to do it. Send us some memes. We haven't had a good meme of the week for the last uh, couple of episodes, so make sure you send some of them in. Um, to you, mate, it has been absolutely phenomenal talking to you. I really, really enjoyed that conversation. I am now super pumped to go and paint something. Yeah, I'm um, buzzing now. So, awesome. so now all I do is go paint. So that's that, that's a, a job well done for you, my friend. Um Thank you very much for your time, and um, it was great to, to talk to you. It was really, really great being here. I really enjoyed it. Good stuff. Uh, Andy, Matt, as usual, thank you very much indeed. And chat, thank you as well. We will see you soon. Ciao. Ciao. Bye.